229,656 people read the articles that we put out, which is a crazy number. Um, we, Pre-COVID, we really didn't do this type of thing. Um, we're a very small part-time staff, and we really focused on our in-person interactions. Um, when COVID came along, we realized we really needed to find a way to stay engaged and relevant to people. And so we started doing these weekly articles um, and online programs. And they really hit a chord with people. Um, they just really started to grow and take off. And people were, I mean, we would release them every day at 8.30 on a Tuesday morning. And if they weren't out by 8.35, I was starting to get calls. It was, it, it was crazy. Um, so we've just seen that online presence grow and grow and grow. And so we really committed time, um, staff time, and resources to continuing that online presence um, because we're really, you know, we'll, we'll reach 5,000 people a week with these articles online, um, which is just fantastic. Um, we had free admission days on the first Thursday of every month. Um, admission is free at the museum in recognition of the millage that the citizens of Lowell voted. Um, and then we're also free the first weekend in May. We do a program with the Tri Rivers Museum Network, which is a group of local small museums on the Flat, the Grand, and the Thorn Apple Rivers. Um, and we're all open the first weekend in May for free. Um, so we do have some free admission days that are available. Another number I wanted to point out was our volunteer hours. Um, as I mentioned, we're a very small part-time staff. Um, we have three people that work the equivalent of one full-time position um, to do everything we do, and that just would not be possible without our volunteers. Um, we just have a tremendous group of volunteers working with us. They reported about 3,100 volunteer hours last year. I know that is not a true indication of the amount of time that they've put in. Um, because they truly help us with every single thing that we do. Um, all of our education programs were back. Um, in first grade, we see all little area schools for tours at the museum. In second grade, they come and do a more intensive tour. Um, they also meet us out at the Wittenbach Weggy Center, where we partner with them to do the maple syrup program. We go into the second grade classrooms and do a grandma's trunk program, where we talk about early immigration and pioneer life here in Lowell. In third grade, we partner with Heidi's Farm Stand, and we do a fur trade, a Native American life, and a pioneer farming program for all third graders. Um, they come to the museum for two full days for the museum immersion program. And then in fourth grade, we also see all the little area schools at the Wittenbach for a Michigan history program. Um, we also have an ongoing internship program that's a collaboration between Fallisburg Historical Society ourself and Calvin University and so they come in for one semester and learn how museums manage collections um, while they're while they're at the museum. Um, the museum immersion program is a very special program that we offer for third graders. It builds on the previous um, interactions that we've had with the students and they come in and they use the museum as a classroom. So for example on the first day that they're there they get a chance to wander the museum on their own looking at the different exhibits and find something that they're curious about. Um, and then the staff puts together a research packet for them, and the next day when they come back, they get to learn all about that artifact, and they write an exhibit label that explores why that, in that artifact is interesting. It helps them to learn about something that they're interested in. It also gives them the idea that they can come to museums as a research institution and ask questions and find answers while they're learning about their local history. Um, they do three to four different programs each day they're there, so they get to do a lot of different things. It's all curriculum based and the teachers kind of have a menu that they pick from of what activities they want to do with their students. So it's really designed to help the teachers um, with their classroom teaching. We do a summer camp every year. Um, this year we had a week-long camp where students learned about the early Native American fur trade and early settler history of Lowell, and then they put on a presentation for the community where they explored the actual um, lives of the people that lived here in Lowell at that time. Um, exhibits, we have um, our regular exhibits that are up, um, and then we also have a special exhibit right now on the Graham family. Um, if you haven't been to see it yet, it is a really interesting exhibit. Robert Graham built the building that the museum is in. 
um, as well as other buildings here on Main Street. And his son, Ernest, grew up in that house and went on to become an architect in Chicago and built some pretty famous buildings like the Field Museum, the Shedd Aquarium, um, Marshall Field, some really big, big important buildings. Um, we also were able to resume our public programming. Um, whenever possible, we try to get out into the community and bring the history of our area alive to people. Um, so to that end, we have a public program series where we do four different programs a year. Um, our first program was on Emma Cole, who was a local botanist. She lived in the Virgins area. And she mapped where all the um, different types of flowers were in Kent County 100 years ago. And um, the Kent County um, Land Conservancy and Calvin University are in the process of remapping those areas to look at change over time. Um, so we had the heads of that, that investigative um, program come out and give us a talk. Um, we also did a program on the archaeology of the fur trade, a tour of Oakwood Cemetery, and the life of Magdalene LaFrambois, who was one of our more famous local fur traders. Um, our online series, as I mentioned, has been really popular. We started out doing the ABCs of global history. That went through four editions, so each week was a different topic based on the alphabet. Um, and we've since transitioned into an along Main Street series where we're looking at the individual histories of each of the buildings in the historic district. Um, our plan is when that's complete, we're going to go back to the ABCs. We've received so many requests for different topics that we have a full roster again. So we're going to transition into that later this year. Um, our oral history program has also seen a big growth since COVID. Um, we've been doing oral histories for over 15 years. Uh, but we have a volunteer committee that's really taken that on. Um, Dale Croft, Artis Barber, and Tina Cadwallader. They've done a lot of oral histories. Um, they're currently doing oral histories with all the business owners on Main Street. Um, and the great thing about those is we've turned them all into YouTubes. So they're now all on our website. You can go anytime and listen to any oral history that we've done, which is a vast improvement from our previous library of VHS tapes. So uh, we've spent a lot of time digitalizing all that, you know, kind of renewing the technology so that it remains preserved and available and easily accessible to everyone. Um, we resumed our summer fundraiser. This year we made a change from having it at the museum to having it on the new showboat, which was lovely. Um, and then we continue with our, um, with our other core activities, which is preserving artifacts and information um, about the history of Lowell, answering research requests and genealogy requests. We get a lot of requests every week from people both in-state and out-state wanting to know about something here in Lowell. Um, we've got interpretive boards along uh, Main Street and the Riverwalk, as well as the Lowell Township Park. And then we try to collaborate with as many organizations and groups in town as possible. Um, Again, just really to get that history out there. We're lucky we have a community that really values its history and is interested in it. So it's a real pleasure to be able to bring that public history aspect out to people in as many ways as we possibly can. Um, so I want to thank you all for continuing to support the museum and all our efforts to preserve this <coughs> history. Um, we really have a great community history and. Um, a great support network for preserving that history. So we thank you. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to, happy to answer them. Even from the Even from the back. You're back. I have 10 questions. Go ahead. Where were you on October 22nd? Probably at my daughter's basketball game. <laughs> I would like to thank the museum. They do these interpretive boards, we see them all over town, right? And most people just walk by them. Behind my building, 217 was made, we had a sinkhole in the back, and it was only about that big around, and it went straight down, and it was quite baffling and confusing. Ralph and I went over, and I said, Ralph, I think there was buildings there, and we used one of your interpretive boards, and sure enough, there was a livery there and a machine shop, and that hole <laughs> was from there and it, it literally started to rot which caused it to drop so you help in more ways than than you know that's great that's great to hear yeah i'm going to disagree with marty <laughs> i see people reading the boards all the time oh. <laughs> <laughs> i do 
you too, which is great. Some of those boards have been up going on eight years now. I think our first one was 2014, so. Yeah, I just want to make a couple public comments. Um, um, I want to thank Lisa for being such a great community partner. Um, a personal friend and Ben Oh, Craig Fonger, Fallisburg Historical Society, and local address is 827 North Washington Street. Sorry about that. Um, so yes, um, I want to thank Lisa for being a great partner, not only with Fallisburg Historical Society, but to me personally and mentoring me. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and we have some exciting programming coming up that we're creating together, and um, looking forward to forward to the community being able to share that. Um, also, thank you for the uh, Lowell Fire Department for being out at the Fallisburg Village celebration last summer. You guys had to actually do a little work out there. Um, and uh, so thank you for that. That'll be enough. Thank you, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't mentioning that. What if anyone's going to say something nice about us now? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Craig. Um, also, um, I want to uh, thank uh, another community partner who's in this room that they have not yet uh, spoken yet, and that is uh, Lowell Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you, Liz, for putting up with me. <laughs> um, and yeah, just being a great partner and helping to support us. Thank you. Any other questions? I'd like to thank you, though, for allowing I'll get in my store and how it goes. Sometimes I can ask Lisa a question on a particular piece, or maybe we find something that she may be interested in. But I think the greatest thing that the left, that the museum's ever done was is the old Robert E. Lee sign that was on the back of the showboat. It was in the building down here. It was getting walked on, stacked on. Uh, I made a request to Lisa if there's any way we've got 16 foot ceilings in the museum graciously allows us to have that in there for people to see so if you've never been in there it's there uh, it didn't go away and it's uh, i thank you guys for that that's not no it's heavy down off the <laughs> and the museum also has annual memberships if you don't have one we do, and if I could just make a plug for that, our building is 150 years old this year, and so we are trying to get 150 new members. Membership's not expensive, it's $15. Um, you can go on our Facebook site and find a link and sign up super easy. Um, but yeah, we're trying to generate some new, new support, new members um, to keep this going another 150 years, so if you're so inclined. Your membership card even comes with Lisa's autograph, which is worth way more than what I think. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dan, let's talk about this stuff. <laughs> you know, those 36,000 people have to be in that door somehow. The steps in front of the building are in sad shape. As you know, as you drive by, you can see that they're leaning and they're they're in need of repulsion. So this year, uh, in our current fiscal year, we've budgeted money to do that type of work. Again, the steps are old, they're leaning, there's deterioration there. Although they don't appear to be in a critical point of failure or collapse, they're in need of replacement. Um, February of 2022, uh, I went before the Lowell District, Lowell Downtown Historical District Commission to discuss the steps and uh, the best uh, way forward on that. Um, Lisa is part of that commission and talked with her as well prior to and during of different options available. Um, there's a picture of the building from the early 1900s where it looks as if the steps were wooden. And then she gave me a picture of the of the building from the 1930s that showed the steps as brick. I believe is the current configuration that's out there. So they've been there quite some time. Um, through the discussions, um, with, uh, with the district and with Lisa is determined to replace the steps with the brick again in a similar design as what they are today. Uh, then the commission also asked if, if we would consider adding a decorative uh, balustrade railing to the structure, similar to what's found on the second floor windows. 
So I wrote up uh, bid specifications for that work with the two options, one the way they currently are, the other with, uh, uh, with, the, with the other railing in there to add a little touch of uh, distinguishing to it. Um, so the two options sent out 16 uh, bid uh, packages to contractor, general contractors and concrete contractors, um, and I only received one bid back. Uh, that was from uh, Ramp Construction Services in there on Kentwood, uh, the price there for the two options. Uh, this uh, last week on uh, February 28th, I met again with the uh, Historical District Commission and went over a, a certificate of appropriateness, which they approved, and uh, they expressed their preference towards option two, which is also my preference. Um, I also asked for money from them through their grant program, but they're out of money. So uh, we we'll talked with Mike and we went over the funding that we have available uh, for this project. We've already received uh, LCTV. Uh, uh, grant in the amount of $25,000 uh, through the money that was budgeted. Uh, the DDA is being asked to, uh, to fund $21,751 towards option two, and then the remainder to come to the general fund. Which is about $7,000. Yeah. For option number two. Yeah, for option number two, yeah. correct. Oh, that's I, am, I am personally happy to see that we are buying to get these done. Uh, Rich started this process and it just seemed like we could just never get it to go. So good job, Dan. Thank you. I love option two. You know, I think it fits our downtown. It fits the way the building looks. And well, that option two did come with a lot of input from the Historical District yeah. Commission and Lisa. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think it does look nice. I think the extra money to be spent on that was well, well worth the, the extra. Just have to last as long as this current. Yeah, we're doing pretty good. Thank you. All right. Any other questions for Dan? Okay. Let's see. Motion for the Ram construction bid for option number two. I'll make that motion. I'll support. Any other discussion? Any other discussion? Sue. Councilmember Salisbury is absent. Councilmember Yankovich? Yes. Councilmember Chambers? Yes. Councilmember Groves? Yes. And Mayor DeVore? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, 990 North Washington demo. On Monday, February 27th, the city opened bids from four entities interested in demolishing 990 North Washington. We received bids from four entities. Earthworm dozing and excavating from Lowell at a cost of $13,950. Grant and excavating at Granton, $17,900. Alpine contracting from New Wago for $18,750 and pitch companies out of Grand Rapids for $18,950. All bids included the cost of demolition along with the asbestos and lead, te lead testing which is required. If there is an asbestos removal, there will be an additional cost which is unknown at this time. The city has had earthworm work in the past with us with, with no issues. Earthworm has the ability to complete this work and I spoke with them to verify they understood all of our requests for the bid. I believe they fully understand the scope of the project. The water fund has been used to collect all rents in the past for this property and has paid all taxes for this property. Payments for this work will continue from the water fund. I recommend that the Little City Council approve for earthworm dozing and excavating to complete the lead and asbestos testing and demolition of 990 North Washington at a cost not to exceed $13,950. Seems very well. Yeah. One floor that we thought. A lot, of, a lot less than I thought. Yeah. Is that both buildings, the little one that's sitting there? Everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Good. Make a motion to approve that. A support. Motion and a second. Any questions for Mike? Sue. Councilmember Yankovich? Yes. Councilmember Chambers? Yes. Councilmember Groves? Yes. Mayor Gore? Yes. And Councilmember Salzmiel is excellent. All right, item D. So when we did the parking ordinance or whatever, um, there was a bunch of questions and um, some comments in the community that maybe we didn't publicize it well enough, which I personally disagree with, but um, I put it back on here um, so we could talk about it. I don't think the ordinance is changing at all. I think this is more about whether or not there needs to be timed parking signs or loading zones or 
whatever else. So I'll open it up first to public comment and then council discussion. Just could you have anything for no, before we start? That's accurate. Okay. This wouldn't change the ordinance. This is just policy decision regarding limitations. Okay. So Susie, you have letters? I do. Oh, I have okay. Okay. Yep, go ahead. The first one, my name is Karen Wade. I am a business owner and registered voter in the city of Lowell. I'm asking the city council to reinstate two-hour parking along Main Street. It is gratifying to see parking on tonight's agenda as new business. This has happened because numerous business or owners in the Chamber of Commerce have made their concerns about the two-hour, about the removal of the two-hour parking limits along Main Street and the way the city council handled its removal, knowing, known to the city manager and the city council members. Thank you for recognizing this as an important issue. Business owners have patiently pursued how to restore this much needed parking restriction. One month after the city council abruptly eliminated removal of the two hour limit on February 6, the discussion to restore the limit is now on the agenda. It was a surprise and quite a shock to uh, many businesses, that is the business owners took the time to educate owners on the action taken by city council and what would be needed to get this policy change reversed. The city of Lowell and our chief of police chose another path. A letter from our chief of police approved and sanctioned by our city manager was placed in U.S. postal mailboxes or in some cases handed to business owners or employees on Wednesday, March 1st. That letter has been re reviewed by many business owners as trying to under undermine the process to redress this by City Council. We know that City Council has the power and authority to reinstate two-hour parking along Main Street. Quote from City Attorney, the signs were removed because the City Council decided to direct the City Manager and the Police Chief to remove them. The City Council could consider that and have the signs reposted. That is policy decision. The City Council could take that issue up again at a meeting if they chose to. First, you and other concerned business owners would need to talk to your representative city council members about your concerns to see if they are interested in reconsidering. The chief of police in his letter stated, the city council has directed the police department to not enforce two-hour parking. This raises another question that remains unanswered. When did the city council direct non-enforcement? Maybe at the moment on February 6th, that parking ordinance 23-02 was passed with modification. Two hour parking signage was removed around February 8, approximately two days after city council voted to add at the last minute removal of the two hour limit onto a previously vetted parking ordinance. No such directive would be needed as soon as the signs were removed. Enforcement of the existing two hour parking limit signs fell under Michigan code and did not require additional parking ordinances from the city of Lowell. If the directive was made before the council voted, there are more problems than just two hour parking. This question is timing directives through the city manager to the chief of police could be resolved by city council members refuse to answer any questions. How can the many small business owners who have spoken up about the removal of the two hour parking along Main Street feel the least bit confident that our city council intends to act in an expeditious manner to restore the parking limits that are cr so critical to the success of our small businesses. When asked at Coffee with Council why two-hour parking was removed, the two members present refused to answer. We now know the existing signage was legal and enforceable. Again, why was the two-hour parking limit removed? They further refused to discuss any details about being contacted by business owners and stated they had been advised by the city attorney to not answer any questions and emails that might later be requested under FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, or in person at settings such as the monthly coffee with council. At one point, one of the council members stated, why pursue this on your own? No business owner who is concerned over this issue would be anything but skeptic skeptical overhearing a statement like that because none of the council members have bothered to communicate with any of the business owners that have contacted them. Three votes are needed to restore the two-hour parking limit signs on Main Street. That could be done tonight. There has been absolutely no communication to reassure business owners that their concerns have even been heard, much less will be supported. And why is it city council members can't acknowledge receipts of emails, multiple emails from business owners over nearly one month time period? 
Business owners at Coffee with Council on Saturday repeatedly expressed their frustration and the disappointment that our city council members refuse to even acknowledge receipts of emails. The question has been posed to our city attorney. Quote from email to our city attorney, please answer this. Can city council members acknowledge receipts of emails? I believe this can easily be done without comment on specific items within any given email if needed the biggest concern is FOIA at a future date. As of 3 p.m. today, no response from the city attorney has been received. Is there any possibility this could be answered, answered here tonight? And so we wait. Hopefully that at least three members of our city council will take the necessary action tonight to put back into the policy to our parking along Main Street. Additionally, they will direct the city manager to direct the DPW to immediately replace the signs that were promised to be kept at DPW and direct the chief of police that he will enforce this parking limit. The city manager is the only person, is the only position appointed by our city council. The chief of police and the director of public works work for the city manager. Bottom line is they are all responsible to you, city council. My name is Michael Lowry at 216 West Main Street, Suite 2. I own a local business that has been around town almost 10 years and it has come to my attention that the two-hour parking limit was discussed at one of the last city council meetings. I try to make every effort to attend these meetings normally when I'm in town. However, I'm currently out of state. I would put, like to say that I am in favor of keeping the two-hour parking limit. Getting rid of the limit would very negatively impact my business. I have many older customers who are coming in continuously to buy the CBD products to help to help with the to rid of the excuse me to buy the CBD products to help with their mobility issues and such and need to ensure that there is accessible parking available for them out front. People parking out front for longer than two hours have commonly been a day-to-day -day issue. I feel that removing this would further encourage other store employees and condo owners who have parked there for over two hours in the past to start parking there once again. Thank you for your time and consideration, Michael Lowry. The, only the two? Two. Can you look at it? I just wondered if you could, um, there's been a, different things I've read and a lot of different opinions on things. Um, one thing that was in the letter that was handed out by Chris Hurst was that it was going to be year-round, no parking from two to six. So um, but if you could just maybe sure. give us your what the goals were of this ordinance. And I, yeah, what I, can tell, I can tell you the ordinance. I, I, I can't speak for the goals. Yeah, no, I just, but I don't I can tell you, yeah, the, the ordinance, the, there were two things to the ordinance. The one thing was they eliminated overnight parking from 2.2 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. on Main Street from Hudson to Jefferson year-round. Um, and then the other the other thing they did was they they aligned the parking ordinance for the overnight street parking to the parking lot. So during the winter months, from November 1st to April 1st, between 2 a.m. and 6 a.m., there would be a, there would be no parking in the parking lots unless you live there or be in, and they were issued permits. Um, there was also some confusion in the letter. Um, pertaining to the permits. Um, we obviously need to identify who the people are that need the permits. We obviously need to identify the vehicle. Um, some people have had permits issued with their, with their names and addresses. We are, um, I've directed the police chief that there's no need, and the police chief agrees there's no need to put those out there. So those people that have those can come back, we'll issue you a new permit. We will also issue guest permits for people who reside in the apartments um, also, if there's a situation where businesses might work during those hours, we, we can issue a permit for that as well. So um, there were some things that were brought to my attention from Councilman Chambers, so we did try to address those. Barry Beecham resided at 924 Riverside Drive. Um, so I guess I, I would my recommendation would be to look at all these because I think there's 
many issues besides the the to you know the to our parking um, that you look at all these. Um, I question: Is it necessary to have no parking on Main Street during the summer months when there's no snow or snow removal? Because you know that it's obviously snow removal. Um, I just think that there's a, quite a few things that I think ought to be um, explained exactly what's going to happen. And I think just quickly voting on something tonight, um, I, I don't think that's in the best interest of all of everybody. And the other is I do want to state that the coffee with council, there was a total of during that time, there was a total of nine people that attended that along with, that includes the two council members and um, Mr. Fowler came in the last half hour and, and Mr. Barkas and Mrs. Barkas came, you know, nine-ish, which is from eight to, to 10. So I'm just saying, it's not like there were hundreds of people attending that. you want to go first, or would you like me to go first? Yeah, no, I would, please. Um, I was approached by a business owner that questioned some things that they were told, and there was three things that weren't correct. One was, and they researched and got the answers themselves, but they wanted me to be aware of it. One was um, chalking tires. They were they were informed that it, you can. Well, Michigan Supreme Court, or the uh, Attorney General, I called their office to verify, knowing, and I was told, no, you can't, because the Supreme Court uh, said, no, no more doing that. It <clears throat> violates your Fourth Amendment right. Um, the second thing they question is, is and they knew it probably wasn't true, but they were told. We talked about it, voted on it, quick through in the removal, and there was no other discussion other than that, and that was a falsehood because we had been talking about this since October to try to help the DPW and to do other things. The, and the third one, um, I guess, I had a conversation with the individual and. Basically, they were asked if they would write a letter. Uh, they did write a letter, and they were the, this business owner was to, told that that business was on board and, in fact, um, wanting it back. And in reality, uh, they're totally fine with it not not coming back. So, I question what some of the businesses have been told by uh, people or through the rumor mill or through whatever but um, this particular business owner when they speak i tend to really pay attention so you covered what i was going to say i was going to make a comment about the repeated times tonight that i've heard the words abruptly or surprisingly that is not how this council operates, and I think everybody up here has made it a goal to not do it that way, and to allow anybody who wants to speak at any time to speak, and to have public hearings, and to leave things in old business, and um, to be accessible. We are all accessible. Um, I will never, and I would implore you to find a local elected official who would, I will never reply to an email asking me how I'm going to vote on something. I won't do it. I will never do it. I've, I will reply to inquiries or questions or anything because I do like to be accessible, but if you ask me how I'm going to vote on an issue, do not expect an email back because I'm not going to have you send it to the other four council members and say, hey, he's going to vote this way. No. No. I'm not violating open meetings for anybody. So, but this was we, not abrupt. This has been on the agenda. We've discussed it. We're discussing it again. So don't. We tried to explain 
that answering an email with questions about how you're going to vote and the open open meetings act and as someone who early in his city council career <laughs> got his hand slapped a couple times i'm very wary of that i don't appreciate letters being read that are full of assumptions i i don't know how anyone could speak as to whether or not I or any of the other council members I'm take I'm listening for me and I'm speaking for me I've spoken to several business owners about this issue in fact I ran into one after council or coffee with council on my way to my shop and I told him hey we're revisiting this on Monday because he had reached out to me as soon as he found out about it and expressed some concern along I heard from a couple of others as well so um, I communicate with people that communicate with me and I'm glad that we're looking into it because it's a pretty complex <laughs> yep. issue Uh, Pearl Bartkus, I own Ability Weavers at 215 West Main Street. I also live upstairs. Thank you for looking into the parking thing. Um, that was concerning to us um, as residents and business owners. Um, thank you for kind of clarifying some of the, the parking issues because we had questions about guests and uh, other things. So thank you for looking into that. And again, I realize that's a, a kind of a moving target to get that dialed in. I just want to speak my opinion of, of this. Um, I want it to be very clear how I feel about it. It may be very different than other people feel. But as a business owner and as a resident of Main Street, um, mainly as a business owner, 90, 85% of the people walking my store are not from Lowell. They are exploring our town. They are checking out our businesses. They are, um, sometimes they come specifically for my business. Sometimes they've been to Marty's business and walk next door, which is fantastic. Usually at the end of that conversation, I say every store and every business in this on Main Street and in town is very unique. And I think all of the business owners would love it if you would stop in. And I think you would enjoy stopping in at each business because there are differences. I mean, we have one, two, three, at least three, four um, antique stores on our block. And they're all different. And they're all great. They all have something unique to offer. When I offer that, if they're parked on Main Street, and they are limited to two hours, if that was the case, they cannot explore our town. I understand the turnover of, of parking. And I would hope, and maybe I am naive to believe this, but my employees are instructed to park near the back of our parking lot. We never park on Main Street. As residents, we never park on Main Street. Our guests do not park on Main Street. We do not park overnight on Main Street. Um, I would hope that the majority of business owners would have the same consideration for their other fellow businesses. Now, I may be naive, and I'm sure there are some that they don't have a parking lot immediately behind them like we do. So I get that. Um, but I really do not want to discourage people from exploring our town. You cannot stop at the new taco place, get a few drinks, get something to eat, and explore our town in two hours. I would love to see them stay. Um, so I think it is complicated. We do want turnover of those parking spots, obviously. I do encourage my um, regular customers to park behind our store. I have been um, approached by fellow businesses to tell my customers to leave um, their parking spot on Main Street, which I don't appreciate because those are my parking spots also. Um, I offer a four-hour weaving class. They are there for four hours. When they're done with their class, I recommend that they stay in town. I recommend that they go get something to eat. I recommend that they go to the bookstore, that they go to Cliff's shop, go see something in our town. I don't want to tell them to move. That's just my opinion, and I know it's very different than some of the other uh, business owners, and I respect their opinions as well. Um, but it is complicated, and please, Give it lots of thought. Don't make a hasty, quick decision. Thank you. And I'll say that I don't. Sorry, I don't park downtown. 
because I can walk. And then I'm not limited and I'm not taking up a spot. Um, even when I come here for meetings and stuff, seven to eight months of the year I'll walk. But um, I wanted it back so we could talk about it, so we could talk about it. So I'm interested in hearing as many opinions as I can because I'm not an expert on downtown parking. I do, however, feel that a two hour sign is a deterrent. I really feel like it's a deterrent. If it was me and I was in downtown Ann Arbor and I finally found a spot and it said two hours, I'm probably going to skip three or four stores. Ann Arbor will let you park as long as you want. It was just well, that's yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My you pay. experience, you, still pay. you pay. And I don't, I don't think you're, just to add that, this city should not, I would never recommend that at all. I would never recommend that. This, the city doesn't need that. Eric Marcus, uh, I would just like to ask you about communication. And this, for, this is in response to the email that I sent the group uh, a week ago. And I communicate best through email. And, and I have not reached out at, through uh, phone calls and that. I haven't done that. And maybe that's the, the way to do that. But I guess where I'm going is um, for the citizens, when we have a concern, I, I emailed the group, and I didn't get a reply. And I know you're not allowed to reply with a lot of things, and, and, and I understand that. But at least it would have been nice if someone would have just said this was received. That, that's all. That would, that would have been good for me. Now, Marty quickly told my wife, who told me, that they got the email. So I, I was okay with that. But just in general, um, if you could clarify how the citizens should communicate with you, what type of response we should expect, and possibly the, the attorney could give us the best way to do that in, with all the rules and that. But again, I would have appreciated just a email from someone, or maybe just an automated email. It doesn't have to be from anyone. Just from City of Lowell, message received. Thank you. So I had a discussion today with our city attorney and I brought that very question up, Eric. And I was told that as long as we, you're right, there are some things we shouldn't get into the weeds about, and then there's other things like this. But uh, our city attorney uh, clarified that uh, we can email back and say thanks, got it, short, sweet, simple. That way then you know your email was received and you know, we opened it and we looked at it. So from now going forward from now on, if you send me an email, now I know I can quickly, you know. I'll do the same. You got it. Yep. Yeah. Same. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, before, hang on, Perry. Greg, can you do the name and address thing for your comment earlier? Uh, for uh, Susan? Greg Canfield, 403 North Washington. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, Listening to Burl um, makes a lot of sense. Um, I was for the two hour, and the only reason why I was for the two hours for the city to have some kind of teeth, because I personally witnessed employees from different companies park on Main Street and park there, and that's not. The, I mean, that's not the idea. The idea is to have customers and have people come in and enjoy your city to have an employee park um, I think you know whether whether owners whatever can insist on them going someplace else that's the only reason why I was looking at the two hour because I've witnessed employees from different locations park on Main Street um, with that the other why I, the other reason why I say that to take time to figure this out, is I know like so with Main Street in Greg will have forms that he can hand to the people but what happens to a guest that comes in for the Barkuses or somebody and they decide oh I'm gonna spend the night at the Barkuses tonight City Hall's closed how are they going to go and get a um, parking permit to be able to park 
in one of the lots overnight. I just I think there's a lot of questions and a lot of things that need more thought before you actually, you know, go and and figure this whole thing out. Thank you. Isn't that what you were talking about earlier? Is yeah. So what we can do is we can issue like a like a guest pass, or if they want two, we'll give them two. And then so that's not then the area, right? And but they keep would have it at their yeah residence, so and then so every resident on Main yeah. Street would have to come and in. They could just it, hand it to their yeah. When we when we issue the permits, we should you know after more we looked at it today, we can issue a couple because I had a couple of people talk to me about that too, and that makes sense. And my my point is, those all all those things need to be written out how you're going to address all that mm -hmm. as to just, oh, we're going to vote tonight. Yeah, and right. Kimball Deluie, 810 Riverside. My wife is Patty and daughter at Sweet Seasons. Um, so I've been listening to a lot of this. Um, several years ago, I was um, one of the board members at Impact. And um, that was primarily when we were at the uh, Water Lord Lighthouse YMCA. Now, we had room to grow. There was more um, real estate there to put a bigger building on, um, to hold even what um, we're currently holding um, on Fulton Street there. The problem was parking. There just was not enough parking to put all those people. This town is growing. And um, you know, I know even right around us, there's two or three more buildings that are going to be putting apartments upstairs and all that. We're, we're running out. We're, we're, I see that too with the new uh, Mexican place in the middle of the bridge. Um, that was already that parking around there was already strained before that was put in, and um, I, I'm concerned for the businesses on that. Um, even if we, you know, lengthen the parking from two to three, I, I like Liz Baker's idea of three maybe or four or whatever, but somehow earmarking some of that so that our our customers and all that have places to park and so that say even business owners don't abuse that parking um, which is so limited already somehow some determinations need to be made on what's okay for what you know I've, I've heard some you know kind of off the cuffs if you've got some cars to store long term go way to the back by the um, by the high school administrative offices and things like that but but I don't know of anything written in stone so it seems like as we're growing, this really needs to be looked at. And um, this is more than just a, a two hour parking issue. I, I don't know what the right number is for that, but that really needs to be looked at. So people, uh, the, the reason we have rules in place, right? It's not because of the 90% that are gonna do the right thing. It's for the 10% that are careless and don't do the right thing. So um, I really encourage you to take a little longer look at that and maybe at least designate the kind of parking that is. Right now, the way it is, I can take my Yukon and put our pontoon behind it, park in front of the shop, take up three or four spaces. I don't have to move it till 2 a.m. Is that the right thing to do? No, it's not. We really want that for our customers, not for um, not for our employees or, or um, shop owners or people living in the apartments. So that's my piece. Thanks. Thank you. I think that there's room for creative solution here. Greg Canfield, 403 North Washington. Um, I think that a good compromise, and that